Um, all right, so primarily the first we're going to start off with the midterm stuff. Um, then we'll move on to models, and with the time, we'll get to AB testing. I just don't know that we will. Uh, so there it is. Um, just FYI, so I posted the midterm study guide uh, last night, and you can consider everything in there is what will be for the midterm. But nothing else. So I'm going to cover some content maybe today, definitely on Thursday, that will actually not be in the midterm. Okay. So if it's not in that study guide, it's not going to be on midterm. Uh, there's also there's what are called tuples or tuples, depending on who you ask, uh, that are mentioned in the study guide. Those will also not be on the midterm. Okay. So you don't have to worry about those. But they are kind of handy. Uh, so that's why they're in the study guide. Um, there are there any questions? Anybody look at the study guide? I know I posted it late last night. There was uh, some miscommunication about getting it out the door, uh, but hopefully it's there. Um, if you find any bugs in it, please, please, please uh, post it on Piazza. Uh, I checked it again last night, um, but every semester somebody finds a new bug. Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there could be errors. I mean, it was human created. Um, in fact, it was uh, human created by one of the groups uh, from. The first semester last year. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's had some evolution, but, you know, obviously there's always still a possibility of mistakes. All right. Any questions? And we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about the content first. Then we're going to talk about the format, which I'm making a little bit of an adjustment to, hopefully to make it simpler. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Or your, your opinion may be different. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, so first thing, in the science life cycle, I talked about this basically in the first class. This is something you should know, okay? Um, I It's kind of one of those things where like just straight memorization is not a bad idea, um, but you should kind of have an idea of what each of these phases are. Um, there, I don't think I've published like a formal definition of them, of them. So what I'd be looking for is like an approximate, you know, this is kind of what we mean by this uh, phase, okay? Because the idea of this life cycle is really that you kind of understand the life cycle and understand the phases. So it's it's not so much like having a formal definition as much as it is like, you should understand what this means, right? All right. These are some hot terms. I'm not going to go through them, but here are some definitions. We'll post these slides tonight. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to mention. Um, a lot of videos of the lectures are up. The remaining ones uh, should be up tomorrow. Uh, sometimes YouTube decides it doesn't want to do things particularly quickly. So if there's one that needs further editing or whatever, it may not be up till um, like the end of the day tomorrow or something. But I'm hoping that they'll all be up actually tonight. Um, but, you know, Sometimes YouTube takes a while. So uh, we'll have to see how it goes. But they should be all up there uh, in case you want to watch any of the old lectures. All right. Any questions? All right, I'm not going to go through each thing around here. Uh, here's some more uh, kind of terminology. Um, I will say, on the next slide, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I do tend to like to ask. Kind of formal definitions as well so it's kind of important that you know what these formal definitions are um however i i do have a, a potential cheat for you in uh like eight more slots so you'll see um differences between graphs okay so what they're used for when they're used what they're called this is kind of a pet peeve of mine uh as a as a subtle hint that it is likely to be asked that kind of question on the exam uh, because people make mistakes about these a lot. Uh, and so I tend to almost always test for it. Okay. So make sure you understand how graphs work. Um, so, yeah, so we have the uh, like a line graph or a line plot and then a scatter plot. So, a line graph is usually, usually like something over time, right? And a scatter plot is comparing two things. Okay. And then we have a bar graph, uh, which is kind of another kind of comparison, except it's about categorical data. And then 
you kind of are turning a numeric set of data into categorical data by creating a history. Uh, so they're kind of good for showing the comparison of things uh, similar to a bar graph uh, is a histogram, but it has all those extra properties based on its actual physical size uh, that you can use for calculations. Um, I think histograms are the thing that people find uh, most confusing. Uh, I strongly recommend go, you know, kind of YouTube search uh, some histogram intros. Uh, you know, I showed a couple in the class. I think I left a couple more in a slide I didn't show, but is embedded in the PDF uh, if you want some kind of good examples. Um, so if you, if that helps. All right, pivots. Okay, so uh, I had this happen to me again. Um, pivots are great for displaying things. You don't use pivots if you want to calculate something or like use it as like the interim step to calculate something later. Use a group a group method. Okay, don't use a pivot if what you're trying to do is like build, you know, more data. Okay, if you just want to display something, pivots awesome. It's really good for that. So it's kind of like it should be the last step in whatever process you're doing, not an interim step. Does that make sense? Okay. So I saw this again. Uh, this might have been before break. I can't remember. Um, so just you know, keep it in mind because it is a very easy mistake to make because it looks like it should be exactly what you want, but it really isn't because they perform oddly. Uh, so what you want is the group method. Uh, is it's analog? You use it basically the same way. Um, and just like I said, keep it in mind, pivot should be for display, not for uh, kind of production. All right, so uh, this particular semester, I don't know if I explained it poorly compared to prior semesters, uh, but I've had a lot of questions about methods and what methods are and how they work and when to use them. Um, so pay particular attention to this, okay? So the easiest way I think to understand it is that you're using all of these methods all the time, right? So as simple a thing as like int, which converts a string to a number, right? To the example here, which is max, right? Which shows you the biggest number out of a set of numbers, um, you know, or uh, the like MP average, uh, which gives the average of a set of numbers, um, you know, or the group method, right? That's another one. So if you think about what all those are and how they add functionality, right? You go back to my uh, example of a carpenter, they only bring certain toolboxes on the truck with them for a particular job, right? You gotta be able to go have, like construct those toolboxes out of hopefully other people's code, okay? Which is where we get methods like Max, like somebody else wrote that method for us, okay? They made it available to us through the language, okay? That doesn't mean that you don't have your custom tools, okay? So things that are specifically things that you use maybe all the time or that you need right now to solve this one problem, okay? So you, you sometimes have to build your own tools. And when you build your own tool, that's your, yourself writing a method, okay? And we use the keyword def, which is short for define. So we're defining this name to do this work, whatever it is. So that anytime I reuse that name, I can get this specific example of work done. So this is a really in kind of the approach to kind of creating method. Often the easiest way to do it is actually to kind of write the guts of it first, okay, and like try to do a specific example of whatever you're trying to accomplish, okay, and then take that example and use that to gener genericize it. We usually refer to it as or generalize it and give a name to it. Okay, this seems plausible. Then test that and make sure that it works. And that's usually the best way to get to a method is that we often want to write kind of the simple first try, you know, or like one step of a loop. Okay, write that all by hand first and then genericize it so that we can actually do it a whole bunch of times. Okay, uh, that's usually helps to make sense. Uh, you know, a lot of things when we're doing programming, it is kind of incremental. It makes it makes it a lot easier if you kind of do the first pass at something, try to get that right. Once you have that right, then you kind of take the second pass at it, which might make it a little more generic. Then maybe another pass at it, which actually genericizes it the whole way. So keep that in mind whenever you're trying to build these things. It's a lot easier a lot of the time to build it incrementally. Okay, um, 
And it's only when you get into really advanced programming where it's actually easier to kind of build a generic one first. Um, and even then, it's it's relatively rare. You you generally want to just kind of like, you know, take a take a swing at it, right? Make it kind of work the way you want it to, then make it a little bit better, then make it a little bit better, then genericize it, then make it more generic, et cetera. Okay. Don't limit yourself to the code blocks that are in the Jupyter notebook. Add more. Okay. Build build up. Okay, arrays, lists, and groups. I think most of you got these pretty well. Um, you know, arrays. Uh, so arrays and lists are more generic in Python in general. Okay, they have kind of a more generic meaning than this. Um, but this is the way we use them in this class. So an array is a list of values that is of the same type. Okay, so that we can use them to replace, say, a column. Right, because a column in a table should all be the same type. And I will tell you in the future, right, they may not be, but they should be, okay? Um, and then lists we use because we want to basically model a row, okay? So obviously, those are not going to be all the same type. But if you had, say, one list that was one row and another list that was another row from the same table, the individual item should be as the same type as the prior list, right? So each row is a list. You know, and they should be kind of the same sequence for the types if you're using them as a row in a table. Um, again, lists can be used more generically in Python, uh, but this is the way we generally use them. Okay? And then groups. Uh, groups are really important. As I keep reiterating, don't get tempted by the, the flashy pivot table. You probably want to use the group method, okay? where you, it just groups things together. Oops, forgot to turn on caffeine. Let me know what caffeine is. Um, okay, so caffeine was a little tool built many, many, many years ago, which uh, keeps your screen on so it doesn't go to sleep. Um, and now it is available for like every operating system. Like it, you'll even sometimes see it in websites. So like if you play a video, sometimes it'll it'll even say. Uh, caffeine automatically enabled, um, but that's where it comes from. And somebody created this little piece of software a million years ago called the caffeine that keeps you awake, and hence uh, that's where it comes from. Okay, control statements. Uh, there are actually many more control statements in Python. I don't think we actually get to, it, like, we don't really use any of the others. Um, they are handy, but everything that those do can be accomplished with. If else, elif and a for loop. Okay. Um, so there's a few others, but we just aren't going to talk about them in this class. Um, you know, if you take another data science class, I'm sure you will talk about them uh, because they're handy because they're a little more convenient, but you can actually do everything else with these. Right. Any questions so far? Okay. Probability. Uh, so this is kind of an important, like, straight, you know, somewhat straight memorization, right? You should know how to calculate a probability. You should know how to do the addition of probabilities um, and the multiplication of probabilities. And then, uh, you know, as, as you probably know, right, complement, one of my personal favorites, uh, is also to reduce hold, so you should know what that is, too. All right, and then this one. Um, well, that is much less fun color than it is on the computer screen. Um, it's much more pink in the, on the computer. Um, so joining tables, um, we don't cover it a ton in this class. However, it is incredibly useful, kind of like the group function, right? Like it's a really good way to tie data together so that you can end up with a data set that is, you know, kind of almost like better than its parts, right? Um, and so knowing how to do a join uh, is really useful. Um, this was actually one of the bugs in the midterm uh, guide that I think I fixed. Um, but, you know, so basically you take the table you want to join kind of the starting point, then you use the keyword join, but then you say, okay, here's the column I want to join on from my original table, and then the other table I want to use. And then if that table doesn't have the same column name, you give it the other column to match it against. So in this case, we're going to join our drinks table, uh, which is this one. Um, and on the column cafe, 
And I'm going to join it with our dip counts table, but we're going to use the data from the location column and we'll end up with a table that looks like that. And the key here, right, is that that final table won't necessarily have the same number of rows as either of these, right? Because it's combining the two. So in the case of Cafe Nero, for example, where we have two rows, we're going to end up with two rows over there. Um, yeah, actually, it's not a great example. But the point is that you'll have, um, because you have to apply the discount for every individual thing. So you might have multiple of that cafe, for example, that you maybe didn't before, et cetera. So you, like, you just may end up with more in that side. If you don't get freaked out, if you don't end up with the same number of rows. The other thing is that if you don't end up with the same number of rows, you may not be able to join it back to the same thing, right? Um, not that that would necessarily, most of the time, that's not usually useful, but sometimes it is. Um, the other thing is that um, you need to have it match, okay? So, like, if the if the locations aren't there, right, or if they're misspelled or something like that, it's not going to work, okay? So, it, it is kind of dependent on the data being good. All right, any questions? I think that was, that's all the content. Okay, so those are the subject areas you'll see on um, uh, Friday. Um, the I didn't really kind of cover it in this review, but uh, what, a subject area that will be covered is kind of sampling. Okay, so um, we've done it a bunch of different ways so far. We're actually going to do it a bunch more ways. Okay, but basically it's like we need to pull out a set of rows from a bigger table so that we can do some sort of calculation. So all the pieces of that are in the midterm guide, but I'm not sure it ever actually says like sampling. You know what I mean? uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, I would say the best, one of the best things to review um, would be the probably homework four or um, the lecture notebook from last class, so Thursday uh, before break. All right, now for format. So I decided, because given the time, um, to just go with just a written S, okay? And by written, that may or may not be literal handwriting. I'm not the biggest fan of literal handwriting. Uh, one, my handwriting is terrible. Uh, two, it takes a lot longer to grade. Um, so it may end up actually being a grade scope item. So notice the, the last bullet, please, Bring your writing utensil in case I decide to go that way, or bring your computer in case we do it on Grayscale. Um, either way, the experience of the exam will be the same. Um, and but it is closed book. Okay, so we're just going to fax the kind of straight coding part, which is the open book, or typically has been the open book part. Uh, but you can bring a cheat sheet. Okay, so three and a half inch index card. You know, a big standard index card. Um, you it has to be handwritten and it has to be handwritten in pencil so no using fancy fonts that look like handwriting uh instead it has to be written in pencil uh, so that i can look at it and say oh yeah you you made that okay uh because part of the activity here is um i don't know how many of uh, you all have done this um but uh the handwriting activity of creating the cheat sheet actually cheated me you uh, it pretty well yeah well we have to write code on I'll get to that in a minute. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? I was going to give some sample questions in a minute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the piazza is up. Let's say the number is 1024. Do you have a different question? Same question. Oh, sorry. Any other questions about the kind of exam? All right, so remember it's in the discussion section. Um, we have a couple of people in here that are kind of following different timing rules. So don't forget to show up or plan to stay late if that is the timing rules you are following. Um, it, you should know what those are already. If you do not, please contact me via Piazza and we'll just confirm it to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, okay, so sample questions. So the first one, uh, these are, I think, pretty obvious what they are, but uh, fill in the blank, okay? Um, and so with a short answer, so that should be, generally speaking, a word, maybe two words, okay? Um, so 
Now we're going to actually do these. So n blank is a result being measured. Oh, yeah. What was it? Oh, outcome. An outcome, correct. All right. Correlation is so this one. Actually, that's a little bit long for this. I think I actually would put that one in the next one. So what's correlation? Some kind of relationship, but not causation. Right. So there's just a relationship between the two things, but one doesn't force the other, right? Um, and then what method do I use to aggregate rows in a table? Smile at once. My, you should know this one. I keep saying it over and over again. Join. The join is yes, sort of correct. Um, I'll have to work on the phrasing, but I'm really looking for group. Okay, so uh, when when I say aggregate rows in a table, that's a group, right? Uh, where the join is taking two tables and and joining them together, right? Yeah. What's the difference between correlation and association? So not a lot. Um, so association and correlation. Um, so technically speaking, an association is kind of a looser relationship than a correlation, but. In, uh, to be honest, I have a hard time finding the difference a lot of the time, so I probably won't ask that question. Um, okay, so uh, and then kind of longish answer, uh, you know, so maybe the correlation one should be that, but the, you know, why is it important to take multiple samples when trying to calculate a statistic? And then I just gave the answer for this one, um, because randomness may cause us to get by a sample if we only do it once. Uh, I would say memorize one like this or understand this one because this is a really important question to this class right all right uh sample questions multiple choice so for example it was kind of like the prior slide like i'm going to show you a picture and i'm going to say what type of graph is this and you're going to say it's a scatter by checking the box um and then which so if I, I may also describe something and ask you what graph type to use. So which one would I use for the second question here? Scatter plot. The scatter plot, I think so. Yes, if I remember the question. Yes, that's the scatter plot. And what about the last one? The first one? Uh, correlates related to between two statistics. Very good. Um, and I will be a little tricky in this, right? In the sense that this isn't a complete answer, right? It's it's just that, right? So just kind of keep that in mind. You know, I may because you have your cheat sheets or whatever, I may kind of give a piece of the answer, and it would still be correct, right? Because it is that. It's also some other stuff, but it is that, right? All right, and then this is the closest we're going to get to coding stuff, okay, which will be like, I'll give you a block of code and ask you, does this do what I'm asking it to do, okay? So you might have to puzzle through what the code does, um, but hopefully you're all familiar enough with how to write this code that uh, you should be able to get it, figure it out, even if I wouldn't ask you to kind of write this like this, okay? Um, I don't know how, hopefully that's legible. Um, so this is what should these code, bo code blocks would get us a set of samples um, here. And why don't we last we'll the whole class, but we'll ask you to raise hands. Um, but I'll give you a second before we do it. All right, for the top one, raise your right hand. This hand over here. Okay, and for the bottom one, raise your left hand. Obviously. All right, raise them up. Come on, everybody, pick one. Keep going. I still see people with no arm up. Come on, back corner. I don't see anybody in back, like, you know, six, eight people. All right, so the right hand has it, okay? Um, and the reason is, is because in this one, what we're doing is we're just stomping on it each time. So we're doing, we're going through it, 
but then at the end, we're going to end up with one sample, right? Because I'm just overwriting this thing with this every time. Okay, so the differences may be subtle. So, you know, sit there and really work through it. This is the kind of thing where, um, uh, like, uh, can't think of the word, uh, like, uh, you know, paper on the side, like, like actually plug it in and try it, right? Um, and see if you can figure out what it would do, right? So you can you can read the words, and you know you obviously don't have to do it a thousand times, but if you do it two times, you can kind of work through what it actually would do. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. So I think that was it. Yeah. Uh, all right. So any other questions at all about the midterm? It will be on Friday. Yeah. So the right code? No. It's just multiple choice. Yeah, like that. Yeah. Okay. Like I might ask a code thing, like I fill in the blank and want the group method, for example, and that would be writing code, but I don't expect you to write the for loop. Okay. Do you have a question over here? Um, can you post the uh, lecture 13? Or like, is that posted or is there like a- Today 13. You mean 12? Oh, so that, yeah, then 12. Um, I don't post the actual notebooks, but the, the video will be up yeah. and any notes you took are there. Um, you can also talk to everybody else in the class. Maybe somebody else got better notes than you did. Um, you can also come to office hours and I can review it with you or show it to you. Um, I just don't distribute it. Any other questions? Yeah. The midterm just takes place during our discussion section, right? Correct. Yeah. All right, good. All right, so uh, just remember, bring a writing utensil. Actually, I should probably say bring some scratch paper um, because that would be useful. I'll try to have some around too. Um, but uh, you know, bring uh, in case you need it for you know if you want to puzzle through something like that. Uh, scratch paper is always nice, um, and you can bring a three and a half inch index card, uh, both sides, um, and with whatever you want on it. Uh, you know, I would personally appreciate a lot of drawing, but that probably won't help you with these here. All right, uh, so models. Okay, so this is getting into a little bit kind of more formality of some of the stuff we did like last lecture. Um, and so a model is a set of assumptions about the data. In data science, many models involve assumptions about proxies that involve randomness, for example, chance models. Um, and, and really kind of on what a lot of data science really comes down to is this one generic question. Does the model we created fit the data? Okay, so then the model might be, hey, we were trying to figure out average delay times on United plane flights, okay? And the model we're using is this sampling mechanism. So does, is it representing the data? That's what we mean by fit, right? Does it, does it look like the data? And fit will make a lot more sense when we're starting to think about projection. Okay, and we call it a fit because we want to know if the graphs we're creating will fit the current data, like match the current data, as well as potential future data. And we did a little bit of this talking about like the mid parent height and uh, child height stuff. All right, so an assessment is um, basically it's the test, right? So if the data and the model predictions are not consistent, that is evidence against the model. So basically, what, what, how do we answer the prior question, right? Is we assess the data versus what we're predicting, okay? And so this is the example of using the mid-parent heights and then introducing gender because we found that the prediction of the heights of the children was not great until we introduced gender and then it got a little bit better. Does that make sense? So the assessment on the first one is basically calculate the errors and figure out how uh, old we'll our model, um, and then trying it again and seeing if we get a better model with a you know with a minor change or a major change. All right, so talking about jury selection, um, and so this is where we get to slightly more sophisticated kinds of samples. Uh, so in Talladega County in Alabama. Uh, Robert Swain was a black man convicted of a crime. So, no, he was already convicted. He was already in prison. Um, and this was one of his appeals. Um, and his appeal was that 
his trial was done with an all white jury. Okay. And that's important because, well, let's, let's do a little bit of context setting, which is at the time, okay, you had to be 21 years old and a man to serve on a jury. Okay, this was before a lot of uh, civil rights and women's rights acts uh, were in place. So, um, you know, your age requirement, and then it was only men. So ignoring that, because at the time that was the law, um, but 26% of the population of the county in which uh, this person lived or where it was being tried, I presume it's also where he lived, um, was black, um, but only, uh, you know, there was no one on the actual jury that was white, that was black. Um, and his jury panel, and to give you a little bit more context, a jury panel is you go out and select, in this case, 100 potential jurors. Okay. And so uh, has anybody here ever been called for jury duty? Yes, okay. So not a lot. So you, you get called for jury duty, you basically get a letter in the mail, and you have to show up at a particular day and time, and you show up and you're part of the jury panel. Okay. And that jury panel then gets either selected or not selected based on various criteria, various you know, how much time they have during the day, like all kinds of different factors. But if you show up for a jury panel, that counts as your jury duty. And so you're then not eligible to do jury again for usually a couple of years. Um, so in this case, the panel was 100 men, but eight men on the panel were black. And so what hopefully strikes you as interesting here is that couldn't it have been 26% of the 100 were black? Or maybe, you know, so in other words, couldn't it have been 26 people? Or maybe it's 25 or 27, right? You know, close-ish, right? Not eight, right, is basically his point. Um, and the argument being is that if there had been 26, then one or more than one of them would have ended up on the actual jury, potentially. Okay, but with only eight, they didn't. So this went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and this is what the Supreme Court said. The overall percentage disparity has been small and reflects no studied attempt to include or exclude a specified number of words we don't use anymore. Um, so what does that what does that tell you? What does the Supreme Court decide? They said the difference doesn't matter. It wasn't significant enough. Right. So that the eight versus 26 was immaterial. Right. Um, so the question to all of you is uh, if we were going to provide expert, expert testimony, uh, let's explain what expert testimony is. Uh, sometimes a court, like a judge or whatever, will actually call for a uh, witness about a particular subject. So let's say the um, I think I'm trying to think of a recent lawsuit, but you know, if a, if a lawsuit involves technology, sometimes they'll actually subpoena somebody in technology space to give an expert testimony. In the Supreme Court, there's actually a, a kind of a more generalized formal process for this, where um, organizations will actually, for lack of a better term, write a letter to the Supreme Court about the case giving their opinion as experts in the field. So, so nobody brought them in, but because they consider themselves experts and other people do as well, they want to kind of offer an opinion. Uh, so that's very common in the Supreme Court, typically less common at the lower courts. Um, but then you also have expert witnesses with, you've ever watched the cop show, right? Or, you know, um, those are often will typically be brought in by a lawyer to say, hey, my client is, you know, uh, not able to have committed this crime because of such and such a reason, and I'm an expert because of these reasons. So they're brought in to give expert testimony. So what we're saying here is you're all data scientists, okay? So therefore you're experts in the question of is eight versus 26 out of 100 a meaningful difference? Make sense? Okay, so basically, so this is where we get into the model stuff, which is that so eight of the is less than 26%, but not different enough to show black men were systematically ex excluded, uh, is what the Supreme Court said. 
And so does that model, okay, because that's a model now, does that, is it true, right? Does it hold up? Um, and is eight of 100 a realistic outcome of the jury panel selection process? We're truly unbiased. And so that's what we want to find out. Okay. All right. So the way we do it, okay, is that if you remember last time, we took a sample from our United Flights um, and we just said, give me, you know, random ones out of anywhere in that pile. In this case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to kind of define a distribution and we're going to define a population. And then we're going to ask for samples in that distribution. So, excuse me. Um, so what we do is it samples at random from the population. The way I've been trying to describe this is, let's say we have, you know, a barrel of, um, I keep blanking on words today. Um, marbles, that's it. Uh, we have a barrel of marbles, right? And in that barrel, we have, um, let's say, 25% are green marbles and 25% are white marbles and 50% are black marbles, okay? So what we can do is, but we say we say to ourselves, right, the, the, the actual barrel is of infinite size. So there's an infinite number of those marbles but in that ratio, does that make sense? So if I reach into that, you know, infinite size barrel and I pull back 10 marbles, okay? The distribution of those marbles should be based on that distribution that we kind of set for the barrel, except there's randomness as well, right? So the probability is there, but we may not actually get that ratio of colored marbles. So we have this tool called sample proportions, which basically imagine there's an infinite barrel, and in that infinite barrel, there is a population distribution that is, say, 25% green marbles, 25% white marbles, and 50% black marbles. And then we say, okay, pull out 10, okay? And so it gives us a result. But I can also say pull out 20,000 because it's an infinite barrel, right? And that should also come out with the same distribution. However, my 20,000 sample is more likely, right, to be 25, 25, 25, uh, 50% uh, than my 10 sample, right? Does that make sense? Or at least closer. So that's what we use this tool for um, or this method. And now I was going to show you an example. So, View settings. In the Swain versus Alabama scenario, okay, um, we want a population proportion, and now we're only looking at black people and white people. Okay, so what proportions do I want it to be? And we just think about it in terms of, of like a raw number out of a hundred. What do you think? So if I, if I replace these, I need two numbers, one that represents the black population, one that represents the white population. Exactly. And let me make sure my cheat sheet is open so I don't make stupid mistakes. Oh, sorry. And here was one medium. Um, I, sorry, it is the, de it's the decimal. Um, and it's 74, not 71. Uh, which used it correctly, but I typed it correctly. Um, so now I have, oh, sorry. So now I have an array that just has these two uh, proportions in it, right? So it's 26% and 74. And then, of course, I'm getting the uh, connection error on my other computer very commonly. So then I can now pull a sample from my infinite data. So I can do Let's say we pull a sample of the size 100, um, and but I want to use the population proportion that I defined a moment ago. Okay, and so I pulled out 100. Okay, but it doesn't give me the 100 back per se. What it gives me back is the is the population, like the distribution of the result. That makes sense. So in this case, I went in and grabbed 100 marbles. Okay, with 
um, a rate relationship in marbles of 26% of the marbles were black and 74% of the marbles were uh, white. I reached in, I grabbed 100, and I counted it all out, and then I figured out what percentage were of each type. Um, and I came up with one, I had, you know, called because I did 100, right? I had 20 black marbles and I had 80 white marbles. Okay? And the way you know which color they are is because the, these, uh, the order of these aligns with the order of those. Does that make sense? Even though it's like unlabeled. All right. So now what if I want to do that a bunch of times, right? So I did my, my single time first, and now I want to genericize it so that I can do it a bunch of times. And why do I want to do it a bunch of times? To get enough samples to get a description of what's pretty good. Yeah, pretty close. Um, the way we would say is basically the control for randomness. Okay, so we want to do it enough times that we can control for the fact that if I pull up, you know, I pull up 100, and as you can see, right, just in that one example, I didn't, I'm not actually all that close to the proportions that I picked, right? Um, so in order to do that, uh, sorry, uh, a lot of times this is, Often, why I'll write it first because I'm just going to do this. Okay. So now I can run that method a whole bunch of times and get a result. Let's make sure I didn't come here with changes. Oh, but uh, the other requirement on this method, which I didn't mention yet, um, is that we'll all, because what we're trying to figure out, right, is that eight versus the 26. So we're actually just going to pull the first number out of that array, the result, um, because first of all, we can calculate the other one very easily if we need to, but we don't. We only care about this, one, right? Because that's what we're trying to do. So to do that, I'm just going to say item zero, and now if I call that method, um, I'll get uh, basically just the percentage. And in this case, it was actually perfect, which is kind of interesting. But this time it wasn't, and this one is is less is not perfect, but less bad as the compared to the last one. So now I can just run that method as many times as I want. So I'm going to go down here and I'm going to do that for a thousand times, and and I'm just going to scale it so that it's a whole number. Um, and then I'm going to add it to my array so I can collect them all. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, for a thousand times, I went and reached into the barrel and and you know found out what my distribution was as a result. And then I can now create a table out of that and display a histogram. Okay. And it's a little cut off, but. Um, what you can see is when I run it for a thousand times, I get this distribution like this. Okay. So anything that is kind of screaming out at you about um, this picture and our question of eight versus 26. It looks like there should have been a lot more black men on the panel. Yeah. Can, can you be more specific though? Um, because the, um, the graph of peaks around 26 ish. Which um, is a lot more than the met the black and the right. Right. Um, so so the graph is kind of centered around the twenty six, right, and then falling off. Um, but specifically, what do you notice about that fall off? It's like nowhere near eight. Right. The eight eight's over here, right? There's like nothing in that bucket at all. Like if you go and pull this, we did it a thousand times. Right, with a sample of size of 100, but not once, probably not once, did we get eight. Okay, so it really should never happen. Right. All right. Um,
Yeah, let's go back to the slides. Um, and so now we're going to talk about another model. Okay. Um, but long story short, I think we get back to this in a minute, right? We we kind of unequivocally were able to prove that uh, Swain was correct, right? That that there was no way that if the population of jurors that showed up for the panel was unbiased, that there could have only been eight black men on that panel. And so probably, and this is a common thing in those days, is that jury selection was done by kind of word of mouth. Like, hey, you want to get on a jury? Um, instead of the way we do it mostly today, which is that it really is pretty random. Um, okay, so uh, there was this guy, uh, Brender, Gregor Mendel, um, who was really interested in pea plants. Um, and, uh, but really what he was interested in was uh, genetics. Um, so uh, what he did was he wanted to know what was the influence of one plant, right, on future plants. And, you know, theoretically to be able to extrapolate from that to other kinds of, you know, plants or animals or whatever. Um, and so what he did was he took pea plants, and I never knew this before, I started looking at this, but pea plants are really pretty. Like, those flowers are nice, right? Um, so I don't know if you all have seen pea plants before, but, um, but they come up with either purple flowers or white flowers, okay? And so what he wanted to know was the, you know, how, how does this, like, how does this happen? Like, how, how can I predict what's gonna happen with the, the pea plants? So he basically covered them and discovered that each plant is purple flowering with a chance of 75%, regardless of the colors of the other plants. So in other words, he said, you know, if you reach in that barrel of pea plants now instead of marbles, um, and it will have a distribution of 75% versus 25%. So if you pull out a hundred of them, sometimes, you know, or a lot of the time or some probability of the time, you'll have 75 of them will be purple and 25 of them will be uh, white. Um, and so what he wanted to prove, right, is this model good or not, okay? So how would we go about finding out if that model was good? And that's where we're going to use a slightly different approach. So what we can do is take a sample and see what percent are purple flowers. Sorry, you can read. So instead of kind of looking at kind of the raw numbers like we did in the prior uh, example, where we kind of said, okay, is eight like in the realm of possibility? We're instead going to kind of say, hey, why don't we look at um, when we pull those samples, we'll look at the difference from 75. Okay, so in other words, we're going to look at the errors around it rather than looking at like the individual kind of law numbers. Um, so we can do that by creating a statistic and we're going to subtract the sample percent of purple fire and plants minus 75 and, and then pull the absolute value. So if you remember the bars on the side of the number or the absolute value. Um, and so we can easily measure, is it large? Right. And so if it's large, it means it's far away. We don't necessarily know what direction it's far away, but we don't care either. What we care about is like how close are we to 75%. We don't care if the right answer is 80 or 70. We care if 75 is yes or no. That makes sense. Right. That would be a different experiment to go and figure out, oh, it's actually 80 or whatever. This is just to say, is the 75 a good number or not? All right, and so now we're going to try it. All right, so let's see. There. So when he actually did the counting, he actually had 929 plants all together, um, and he had 709 of them are purple flowers. So we can do this division and figure out that it's actually closer to 76%, right? Or I can't remember if I said 76 or 75, but it's near 76 percent. Um, and so cool. All right. So now we can do the same thing we were doing before. 
Oh my God, I keep getting the uh, service okay. connection. Um, but this time we're going to do. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, but this time we're going to do our array of 76 and 24. Um, and then we're going to basically replicate the experiment. Sorry, this is correct. Okay. Um, and so now we've kind of created one sample using that population expectation, okay? Um, but we use the same size uh, sample, okay? So we went and said, go get 929 flowers out of our infinite barrel. Um, that infinite barrel has a 76.24 uh, ratio of the uh, purple flowers, white flowers. And we found out that when we did it for that 929 block, and this is why I keep saying a set, right? We've got 76% were 77% were purple and 23% were white. Yeah. Um, why is it 0. 0.75 and 0. 0.25? Because when I actually did the math, it came out of 76. So I did 76. You know, the, on the slides, it says 75. And in my cheat sheet, it says 75. So math confused? I don't know. So I'm just going with the 76. Right, because I actually did the math and it came out to be 76. I don't know why I had 75 in the first place. So 76 percent is what we're playing with. Whatever, we'll call it that. Um it's an example. So now we're just gonna turn that into a method, right? And so we're just gonna plot 929 in here, and then we're gonna do item zero. Oops. Item zero again. Okay, now we have our purple flower uh, calculation. Yeah. If we only need item zero or like the first question of the first component, do when we're making the array, do we need like have it the second? Yes. Um, I actually haven't tried it and see if the default will figure it out. Um, this is the kind of place where um, you know, like the the, the method that you're using. It likes specificity. So even though it should be able to just subtract, basically, um, it I wouldn't be surprised if you get an error. To make sure you that's really, really what you meant. Um, so just to simplify our later code, we're actually going to multiply this by 100. Okay, so we can get rid of the decimal point. Um, just make it a little easier to read. And so now we can go off Oops, and run there, and then run one sample. Um, and then now I can run it for a thousand samples. Okay. And so now I get an array back that's got all these different samples uh, using 929, you know, reaching the barrels uh, a thousand times. Ow, should have had output cut off. Is that even turned on? All right. So now I can make that into a table. And do a nice histogram, and we can see that our percent of purple flowers is, you know, kind of in the 76 range, right? But we do, you know, we do have some outliers, right? We get all the way down to 72 and all the way up through like 80 ish, right? Then, and I really wish this wasn't cut off. Wrap it really well. Okay. So We're just going to use the 76 because it's close enough to 75. Um, but technically, he said 75. So, what we do is now we're just going to essentially cut to their errors, right? Instead of dealing with the um, kind of raw numbers. And I'm sorry, this is kind of cut off over here. Um, but
So all we do is now we're going to create a column that has the discrepancy between the two or the error between the amount of purple we got, okay, um, when we did the thousand attempts of 929 draws. Um, and we're just going to add that to our same, or actually to just kind of a random table. And then we're going to throw a, that into a history, okay, so that we can look at it like this instead, okay? And so, can anybody tell me how to interpret this? Like, what, is it, what does this mean compared to the prior graph? Any ideas? So, like, about it shows how, how often it aired zero times and one and three. Right. So, so it's basically showing us our error distance, right? So, most of the time, we were really close. Okay. Because the tallest, you know, the tallest uh, bin is kind of right near zero. And, it, and then it falls off, right? So, so that seems like a pretty decent model because what we want is that fall, right? What would be a perfect model, you think? Yeah, like, like they're, all of them are right here, right? Now, that literally should never happen, but, you know, obviously the faster it drops off, the better it is, right? <clears throat> All right, and then we'll go back to the slides. And so what, what we talk about there is that now we have to kind of frame that in terms of like a formalized question. And so in our jury selection case, we have our model, okay, which is the people on the jury panels were selected at random from the eligible population. But then we have the alternative, Okay, or the model might also be called like the hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. Um, and the alternative is no, they weren't. So ignoring the content there, can you tell me a major feature between there the difference between the model and the alternative? Any ideas? Is this is a hard question to ask. So. There's something really, really important about the model versus the alternative that doesn't actually have to do with this particular idea. All right, that's it. Hard question to ask. Um, they have to be mutually exclusive. Okay, so you have to have all cases covered by either the model or the alternative. Does that make sense? Okay, you can't have any that are on the ball because otherwise, that it, like. Remember, because we will never get to perfect error. So we need to have like a line kind of in our data set, for lack of a better term, right? A line. And we want to say, okay, if, if the stuff is all on this side of the line, it's the alternative is true. And if the stuff all on this side of the line is true, that is the answer, then the, the model is true. Does that make sense? But if it's if it's kind of wiggly in the middle. Then it's we can't make a judgment call because we're never going to be correct, right? All we're going to do is be close-ish. So we need to make sure we know what close-ish is going to land without any question. Because what we can control is that our model and our alternative, like like our statements, are a hundred percent mutually exclusive. That makes sense. So obviously you can do it with more or whatever, but at least in this class, we're really just going to ever talk about two options. Um, and so in the genetic scenario, so each plant has a 75% chance of having purple flowers or no, it doesn't. Okay. And we're just going to say kind of the same argument that the number is, is spread around there. So we'll, we'll, we'll give it to uh, Mendel, um, being one of the first geneticists of all time. So, uh, but the point being is that that one is also mutually exclusive, right? So it says each plant has a period, 75% chance, period, end of story, or it doesn't. Okay. So that's just kind of a really important piece because when we talk about uh, how, like, how we choose the model versus the alternative later, we're going to figure out how close we have to be or like how deep into one side or the other we have to be 
before we can call one of them true. Okay, so that's why it's really important that we understand that they have to be exclusive because we can never be 100% right. So we want to be, you know, we want to control as much of the, of the variables as possible. And one of those is like making sure there's no, that line's not pervious, right? We want to make sure it's solid. Okay. Go to the next slide or what? There we go. Um, okay, so when we do that, okay, so now we've defined what our two choices are, right? We have the model and we have the alternative. Um, and so what we're going to do is what is going to be the statistic that we're going to measure between those two things. Um, and it doesn't always have to be kind of in the model, right? It wasn't really stated in um, this model, right? Um, it, it, you know, but it, but the answer is there, right? So like the, okay, so what's the percentage of people, right? So that's the statistic we're going to use. Um, and in the other one, it's a little more obvious, right? Because we're saying it's going to be 75% purple flowers and so on, right? But point being is we have to choose something to measure the model versus the alternative. Um, and then we're going to simulate that statistic under the model's assumptions. So we're going to do basically those four loops using the proportions that we talked about X number of times to see if we can figure out like what that error distance is. And then we actually calculate it out. Uh, the first thing, you know, is usually helpful is to do a histogram of the data itself, and then um, kind of do a histogram comparing the difference between the data itself and our outcome. Um, and if the observed statistic is far from the histogram, uh, that's evidence against the model. So in other words, like, you know, if it doesn't, you know, if the error rate isn't dropping off real fast, then it probably means the alternative is true. Make sense? But the key here is we always test the model and discover that the alternative is true. If we never test the alternative, we only test the model, and then that shows potentially that the alternative is true or the model is true. But we don't test the alternative and, and think about it in, in the inverse. Okay? Even though they're mutually exclusive, it's considered like that's that's not. I would say it's more kind of a semantic difference than a real difference because they are mutually exclusive. So therefore, if you tested the alternative, then it should be just as valid. But if the only thing we can usually are only able to test one of them, okay? So as a result, the one we can test is the model, not necessarily the one that we think is correct, okay? So in other words, when we, when we frame the question, on the Supreme Court case with Swain, we think about it as, is, is it possible that you would get only eight jurors on the panel, okay? No. What are all the options for the number of eight uh, black uh, panel members, right? Because it's kind of an open-ended question. We want an actual question that we can validate, and so that's why it's our model. Even though we don't really think it's going to be the true the answer, we think the alternative is going to be the answer, right? But we always test what we can test, and that's always the model. And then the alternative is just the other end. Make sense? So this can be really confusing for people because what you want it to be is that you want to test what your gut thinks is correct, right? But that's not always the thing that's testable. So then you have to test the opposite. All right, uh, we we're at 35, so it's the first day back from break. So we'll do any testing next time. Um, but are there any other questions? Anything about the midterm? 